Good morning, good morning or afternoon or evening, wherever you are in the world or later if you're watching it recorded. Time. Hopefully it's a good use of your time. We want you to leave here with some learning, some, uh, some good wisdom and hopefully some excitement and passion about what chaos engineering is and, and how we can apply it to make our lives better. I'm gonna turn my video off so we can uh, look at the slides, but I just wanted to say hi to everyone and, and smile before we kicked into things. After a, a tour of duty at Amazon of, of uh, four years, I had the opportunity to join Netflix, uh, home of Chaos Monkey and, and uh, a company that has espoused engineering for some time, which was a great, great opportunity to learn more and to go deeper. So what I wanna share with you today is just a bit of what we've learned on that journey from our time at, from my time at Amazon and Netflix, and then from what we've had the, the privilege of observing and working with our customers today. So what happens when the internet fails? What happens when your website goes down? What happens when people are unable to interact with you online or in a, in a real time fashion? <clears throat> we know that these are, are pretty, pretty catastrophic, they can be pretty impactful events. Um, I've chosen a few here that happened recently just to highlight the impact that these outages can have on our everyday lives. Uh, at Gremlin, we're a remote by default company. And so we rely on Slack for our day-to-day -day communication and collaboration. When Slack is down, people are unable to get work done. And when you see that email, hey, is Slack down? you know that it's gonna be a, a rough spot for a little while until things get fixed. So that has a real impact to uh, engineers and, and, uh, and everyone's productivity over time across the world. J. Crew had, uh, had a website outage during Black, Black Friday uh, this past 2018 season. Coming from a background of e-commerce websites, I can tell you that it, that's the day you don't wanna have an outage. Uh, the week of Black Friday, the week of Cyber Monday, those are your heaviest traffic days. It's called Black Friday because that's when traditionally e-commerce companies or commerce companies made it into the black. They made enough money those days to, to offset their losses the rest of the year. So what happens if customers come to your website on Black Friday and they can't, they can't access it? They can't purchase things. They can't put things in their cart. Well, they're going to go to your competitors. They're going to go somewhere else. They're going to buy what they want and they're gonna continue on. So this is obviously not ideal if you have a business that is always on that your revenue relies on being on the internet. <clears throat> and then, oh, I was asked the poll too. Yes, my company has had an outage. I'm gonna click yes. Uh, <laughs> no, Gremlin hasn't had an outage in the last three months. Uh, and then what happens when something like an airline fails? We've had two or three examples of airline outages in the past year. Uh, Alaska is one of the most recent, but there's been Delta Airlines, British Air Airways. These outages have been estimated to cost hundreds of millions of dollars. And that's the financial impact. But what is the impact to our day-to-day -day lives? We as a society rely on the internet and on the connectivity that these services provide to be able to travel and visit our loved ones, to be able to send messages, to be able to communicate, to be able to, to live our lives. And so when these things are unavailable, we're, our, our everyday lives are impacted. The productivity and potentially the safety and the, and the ability for people to see their loved ones becomes, becomes diminished. And so this is why we care about chaos engineering. This is why this is important to us. We felt this pain. You know, I've been part of an outage that made the front page of TechCrunch and it's not a fun place to be. But more importantly, I've lived at the world where my mom calls me when Amazon's broken and asks me when it's gonna be fixed. So with that, let me, let me talk a little bit about what is chaos engineering. A lot of people on this call are probably familiar with it. Many people have probably heard a variety of definitions. So I wanna share with you what I found to be the best analogy to describe chaos engineering and then the best definition. So when I'm home for the holidays or I'm with my family, it's always a question, you know, what do you do, Colton? What is it that your company does? You know, what is it that you did at Amazon and Netflix? And I rely on an analogy in order to explain that. And I think the vaccine is the simplest analogy. We're gonna inject some harm in order to build an immunity. Now, if you went back 200 years and we said, hey, I'm gonna inject you with this disease, is that cool? You might've got some pushback. 
It's a little bit of a counterintuitive idea, but there's a lot of scientific evidence that shows us this process of hormesis is a very valuable one. It helps us to uncover weaknesses. It helps us to build immunities. I think that chaos engineering is much the same. We're gonna take a small risk. We're gonna inject a small harm in order to prevent a larger harm or a larger risk down the road. And so the way that I define chaos engineering is thoughtful planned experiments designed to reveal a, the weakness in our system. And you'll notice I focused on thoughtful and planned here. Uh, chaos engineering is not this ad hoc process. We're not going out and just shooting hosts. We're not doing it on our own without involving our team or, or letting people be aware. It's engineering. We're applying the thoughtful, purposeful approach of, of engineering to get this done. We're, it's, it's the discipline that we need to apply to our systems to better understand them and to handle the chaos. And so in a way, we're really engineering for chaos. We want to be able to handle the types of turbulence and failure in our system in the best way possible. Another key difference about chaos engineering than your traditional operations or site reliability or DevOps approach is that this really allows us to be proactive. Uh, the classic operations approach is, you know, after things have broken, how quickly can we fix it? How quickly can we get everyone on board? How quickly can we dig into details and understand what's happened? And then after it's fixed, can we prevent it from occurring again? That's fine, and, and obviously that's a starting point, but we need to get in the position where we're, we're out and ahead and in front of these types of incidents. We would prefer that we've applied this discipline and this approach to our system so that when things go wrong, it can be a non-event and we don't have to get paged. Wherever possible, we want to gracefully degrade. We want our customers to have the best experience. And if engineers or team members don't need to get involved because we're able to mitigate that failure automatically or in a, in a graceful way, that's the ideal outcome. So I want to give a little bit of background about why I, I've seen this sur surge of interest in chaos engineering and why it's become uh, a, an interesting topic and on the forefront of many people's minds. And I'm going to give a little uh, background and, and context here. Chaos engineering as, as a concept is not new. Uh, we've been talking about hardware failure testing and uh, we've been writing blogs about software failure testing and, and failure in distributed systems for, for decades. But our, our systems have changed a little bit. Kind of, this is, this is a, a simplified version, but the, in the old world, quote unquote, you know, we had data centers. And in those data centers, we had redundant power supplies. And we knew what was in our racks. Maybe we had hot swappable RAID drives. We had control of that. And that control gave us the illusion that we could control the failure. But we had control and we could mitigate it every way possible. Obviously now we're in a world where we're moving to cloud providers. Someone else is in control of our infrastructure. We can no longer go to the data center and look at our racks. And if things go wrong, we may just be given a new host rather than having to deal with that old host. And that those patterns change the way we build our architectures. Further, our applications used to be a little bit more straightforward. They tended to be three tier. We had some front end level. It did a lot of the interface. It handled the traffic. You know, we could horizontally scale that out. We had some business logic that that took care of a lot of the, the details. And then we could offload a lot of the work to the database. We'd let that handle some of the consistency. We would let that deal with a lot of the um, a lot of the hard computer science distributed systems problems. And uh, and, and we grew up in that world, but, but that's not the world that we're living in today. So one of the <clears throat> benefits we've had of having to work at some of these other companies, Netflix, Amazon, Salesforce, my team is from Dropbox, from Google, from Twitch, from a, a large variety of, of always on internet services where reliability is king. And this has taught us that, you know, in the new world of distributed systems, of microservice architectures, that some of the assumptions we've made just don't work and some of the old approaches that we've brought to the table just don't scale. 
in particular, that reactive approach just won't enable us to build the kind of highly available system that our customers expect. And, and on that point, customers' expectations have changed. Uh, 10 or 15 years ago, you would wait a minute for, for a web page to download. You would still get CDs in the mail that you might install. Today, if, if a website takes more than a second or a customer experiences failure along the way, they're going to get frustrated and they're going to leave. They're, they're not going to have the patience to uh, work through your outage with you. And we don't want to put them in that position. So I like to joke that as everybody wants to be like Netflix and Amazon, that they're adopting microservice architectures and, and they're building their architectures in the cloud, you're also going to inherit, it, inherit Netflix and Amazon's problems. So this graphic is what I like to call the microservice death ball. Uh, the picture on the left is Amazon circa 2009, and my team actually helped generate this graph. Uh, this is just the retail website. There's no AWS in here. And you can see that the complexity of all of the interconnections, all of the pieces, this, this is, it, 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 the combinatorial explosion is, is just very difficult to manage. It's too much for any one engineer or even one team to keep in their head. And the, the side effects, the knock-on effects, and the ways in which failure can, can flow through the system and can propagate are, are many. And so we have to be able to prepare for that. We have to find a more effective way. The classic approach of let's unit test and integration our test our way out of this just doesn't scale. If we wrote a unit test or an integration test for every one of these connections, it would take until the sun burned out for us to run all of those tests. And so we can't just brute force it. We have to find a more effective way. We have to find a more efficient way. And what we found was chaos engineering, this practice of doing live experiments on a real system helped us to uncover quickly the real bugs, the real configuration issues, the real timeouts and settings that were causing issues so that we could understand this complex system and hopefully force it to behave in a way that was deterministic and, and as we wanted. Similarly, we saw a similar pattern at Netflix. And when I joined Netflix, home of Chaos Monkey, there was a lot of good happening with chaos engineering. But what surprised me is there was still a lot of opportunity for innovation and advancement. And so at both of these companies, I had the privilege of building a platform to enable this type of chaos experimentation. And in Netflix, we were able to build upon the earlier work to provide a more precise, more fine-grained approach that enabled us to build better automation and run better experimentation. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that as we go, but I wanted to set the stage. Uh, microservices and distributed systems are hard. The network is not our friend. Failure can happen at any time, and the knock-on effects are very difficult to predict. So great, the world's on fire. Our jobs are hard. You know, what are we gonna do about it? You know, wh what is the answer? You know, what are you, what are you, what are you gonna tell us, Colton? So, I wanna talk through some of the key concepts of chaos engineering and some of how I've seen the market mature as we've gone through this journey in the last 10 to 15 years. The first one I'm gonna start with is what I think is one of the most important, and that's how do we safely run these experiments? Well, a very key concept here is that of the blast radius. Again, chaos engineering is about mitigating risk. We're gonna take a small amount of risk to prevent a much larger risk from occurring down the road. So how do we do that? Well, we do it in small steps. We begin by running the very smallest experiment that we can. We might run against a single user, a single test device, might be against the phone in my pocket. We might run on a single host or container. We might begin in our staging environment. However possible, we're gonna narrow down the potential impact, that blast radius of the experiment to be as small as possible. As small as that will allow us to learn something. And from that experiment, there'll be one of two outcomes. A, we'll find something that doesn't work the way we expect. It might be configuration, it might be error handling, it might be auto scaling, it could be a wide variety of things, but we're there to suss out, does the system behave the way we expect and the way we want? And if that's the case, great. We could continue on with the experiment. Now we're gonna grow that blast radius. Now we're gonna run it on three hosts. Now we're gonna run it on 1% of users. Now we're gonna run it in the West region. Now we're gonna run it uh, in production. You know, whatever the expansion is, at each step as we build trust and confidence that the system works the way we want it to, we're gonna add to that blast radius. 
And if at any point we find a failure, something doesn't work the way we want, or our expectations aren't met, victory. We're, we're done. We're going to stop the experiment. We're going to clean up the impact. And we're going to take it offline to understand why the system didn't work the way we did, why we expected it to. And we're going to fix it and make it better. One thing that's important to note here is that we're learning different things at different scales. When we're running an experiment on the small scale, on a single host or a couple of users, we may be learning about our exception handling. Do we gracefully degrade? We might be finding functional bugs in our code. Did we handle a null correctly? As we grow and scale the experiment, we're learning a different class of things. We might be finding that we don't time out aggressively enough, and so we're not actually protecting ourselves if things start to go wrong. Maybe we're not shedding traffic in a way that allows our systems to handle a sudden burst of customer activity. Perhaps our thread pools and our timeouts aren't actually protecting us when, when our system is underwater. So it's very important to test both the small scale and the large scale. And ideally, we want to do that as a continuum. We want to do that where we start at one end and we end at the other. And that's a key part of mitigating the risk of these types of experiments. So I want to give an example uh, of a chaos experiment from a customer interaction we had. Um, I'm going to leave the customer unnamed, but uh, I want to talk about a little bit of the context. We were here, and we were running this idea of a game day. You know, this, this opportunity to run an experiment and to validate that the system behaved as expected. And in this case, we're going to inject some latency. Now, this was actually the third experiment in line. So two previous experiments had been run with smaller blast radiuses, a single instance and then 20% of instances. And from that, there was confidence gained that you know, we could run this against 50% of the instances without, without causing a lot of undue risk. And as this experiment was run, what was observed is that well, let me take it back. What we expected to happen while introducing this latency is that there was no customer impact. No, no one should be able to notice. The system should continue plugging along just as it sh just as it normally would. And what was found is that by adding uh, this 400 milliseconds of latency, we saw the outcome of this one to two, one to one and a half second delay that was occurring. Now, the the service was still returning a 200 in this case, and that was a little bit odd. It was a little confusing why that was the case, because people expected that when the service call took more than a second, it should have failed. It should have timed out. And so why was that occurring? Why was that delay there? And yet, why were things still completing successfully? And it's exactly, just sidebar, it's exactly that kind of, huh, that, that seems reasonable, or that seems okay, like it could happen, but why is that happening? And really understanding these, these subtle ways in which our system connects and, and interacts with, its, with it, its other components is a very key aspect. We always think that we understand how our systems behave, but in reality, there's hundreds and thousands of lines of code of libraries that we've written on top of, on our platforms, on our frameworks, on our operating systems. There's tons of code that we rely on in other people's services, whether they're internal or they're external. And so understanding how all of that code fits together and, and how it interacts, it is, oh, there's always something of surprising to be learned. Um, I was on a call with Tammy, one of, our, one of our principal SREs yesterday, and she spoke about how every time she's run a game day, something unexpected has been uncovered. It might have been minor, it might have been major, but every time something has been uncovered. And so in this case, upon digging in, what we found is that there was a caching layer between the, uh, the database that we were introducing delay to and the service. And so in this case, uh, the, the service call would fail, but then the caching tier would kick in. And so another call would be made to the caching layer, and then that cache would return uh, a successful response. Now, the issue here is that that cache may contain stale data. And so there were two things that were really uncovered here. One, there was a caching tier involved in this service interaction that the engineers weren't aware of. And that's the type of, of deep understanding of our system that we need and the type of thing we want to uncover. Second, we were potentially serving cache data to our customers. And I'll sidebar on this point for just a moment as well. That could really go one of two ways. It might be determined by the business that serving cache data as opposed to failing is an appropriate outcome. 
And if that is intentional and desired, then that might become a resilience feature that this service relies upon. But if data durability, data correctness are key, then this could be a huge miss. And showing someone an out of date or incorrect response may be uh, a, a failure of the business. And so this is the type of discussion that might come from uncovering these types of issues and understanding them well. It's a good discussion with the business about how should the software behave and what is acceptable, acceptable levels of graceful degradation. Now, there was actually uncovered here, and I left it last, but it's one that, that I see pretty often in game days and I think is pretty important. And that's that the alerting and the monitoring around these pieces was not fully flushed out. The fact that the cache hits and the cache hit rate were missing from their dashboards was a key piece of information that was lacking from their instrument panel, from how they sail the ship, so to speak, or, or how they operate their service. And so that ability to, to uncover that our learning and our monitoring work correctly, uh, I joke, but it's there's been a number of outages I've been part of where someone just didn't get paged. And an incident took twice as long as it needed to because we couldn't have the right people available to diagnose it. And then our dashboards, if we if we're dashboards are pointing at the wrong data or misleading us, that's going to further exasperate the time it takes to to resolve an incident. And so that's the, the here here's a here's a real world example uh, and one you can tell I'm passionate about about why chaos engineering really is this deep concept that allows us to learn and and unify all of these different concepts, the operations the monitoring, the alerting, understanding how our software works, and ensuring that our customers have a great experience every time. So with that, let me talk you through a little bit of how I've seen the maturity of this space evolve over the past decade or so. Uh, in the beginning, there's Chaos Monkey, and this is where most people start. It's an easy, it's an easy place to begin. You know, you turn it on and you're gonna randomly reboot some hosts in the background. You know, the, the original intent here was if we move to the cloud and our hosts could be removed from underneath us at any time, we need to prepare for that. So let's make sure that that failure mode happens all the time so no one has an excuse to ignore it. And, and this is fine. This is a fine starting point. But what I found and, and what our customers have found is you quickly hit the ceiling of this approach. Number one, there's a time and a place for these random failure tests but it's not the right way to do failure testing for everything. And I don't think it's the right way even to get started. I think thoughtful planned experiments help us mitigate the risk far more effectively than randomly breaking things. Second, failures, you know, host rebooting, that's one thing that could go wrong, but really that's a, that's a subset. There's you know, a dozen more things that could fail at the infrastructure level that we should be prepared for. And so as customers and as teams start out with Chaos Monkey, they, they hit that ceiling and they start looking for something more. And what they need is something that really helps them prepare for all the bad things that could happen to them while operating their service. So my disk could fill up. I could be CPU bound. I could lose, I could have a memory leak. That means that my services are constantly running out of memory. Not just hosts die, but processes die, containers die. You know, those partial failures or grave failures in some cases can be much more interesting and much more devastating than a clean failure like an entire host rebooting. What happens if time changes? The number of daylight savings outages I've seen, uh, I can't count on one hand. <laughs> there've, been, there've been a good number. And those things are, are, are tricky and they creep in. And if we don't have a chance to prepare, we might be caught totally unaware. And so as we, as we become more sophisticated, as we become more disciplined in this approach, we start preparing for a wider variety of things that can go wrong. And this mirrors well, often our operational maturity. So as we begin to better understand the things that could happen to us and prepare for them, it's teaching us how to operate our service more effectively. So, so one of the jokes I like to make is um, my on-call training at pretty much every company I've been at has boiled down to here's your pager, good luck. And I think that we could do a lot better as an industry. I think that we can go in and we can allow new engineers or new team members to go and to practice being on call before they have to do it at two in the morning when, when there's a VP on the call and everyone's urgently trying to, to put out the fires. 
if your if your team ran an exercise with you, hey, you're going to be on call this week, where you're going to get paged, but it's going to be a mock exercise, so don't stress out. We want you to treat it like a real incident. We want you to get paged. We want you to look at your dashboards. We want you to ask questions. Unlike a real urgent event, this is a great chance for people to ask questions and understand what's happening and how to get better. And from that, we can practice so that when a real failure occurs, it's muscle memory. The analogy I draw here is that of the fire drill. There's a reason that we've all grown up running fire drills and that they're run regularly. Because if a fire breaks out, lives are on the line and we want it to be a smooth, coordinated process that allows people to, to behave correctly. The same thing applies in our distributed systems. And while lives may or may not be on the line, millions of dollars may be. Your customer's happy and satisfaction, happiness and satisfaction may be on the line. Maybe it's someone's opportunity to travel home and visit loved ones. Maybe it's someone's ability to process a financial transaction that's very important to them. There, there are very critical things at play here. And so taking the time to prepare and investing in that is something that I believe believe passionately in. Our now we we're able to handle a lot of the bad things that happen to us. Now, how do we prepare for the bad things that happen to everyone else? One of the key, one of the one of the jokes in distributed systems is a computer uh, somewhere else that I've never heard of can can crash my computer, can cause me to have a failure, and certainly that can be the case. There can be these knock-on effects and these cascading failures that can cause you to experience pain or failure when you've done nothing wrong. And ultimately, to be good service owners and to have high availability services, just like handling the failure that could happen to our infrastructure or our own services, we must be prepared to handle the failure that happens to our dependencies. And the best way to go about doing that is to actually fail your dependencies and see what happens. Again, we, we apply this process of the blast radius. And as, this, as, we, as we become more mature, as we go to this approach, one, we have to understand the network better how the network traffic works, how retries work, how routing works, those all become key. Um, discovery uh, is something that often shows up in incidents. And whether it's a cause or a factor, ensuring that we're able to call the right services and communicate effectively can be a challenge when things are going wrong. Because this kind of an experiment can impact several teams at once, we want to move to this approach of the game day. Ideally, we want to get teams in a room and we want those teams to discuss and collaborate because really those teams interact with each other on a technical level. They certainly should have the opportunity to interact on an operational level. We want to think through what the knock on effects could be when we run these larger, uh, more invasive experiments. And we want to be thoughtful about how to mitigate that risk. What is our abort condition? If things start to go wrong, how quickly can we pull that lever to stop things and restore our customer's experience to what it should be? How do we, how do we think through coordinating what bugs are found? In this case, it's often great to have a, to cast a wide net, to allow many people to know that you're running these experiments and to communicate it wide, because you want teams to be able to be keeping an eye out for things unexpectedly occurring. You probably want your customer success team or your support team thinking about this experiment and what the effects might be because they may be seeing customer failures. They may see a report of a new issue or a new customer pain that we weren't aware was, was a side effect of this experiment. And many eyes can help us to spot these quicker. So this really helps us to prepare for the type of distributed systems that we live in today the always connected, always available, always relying on people, other, other team services, whether internal or external. So one thing I'm not gonna do on this session is I'm not really gonna talk deeply about Gremlin. Uh, we believe at Gremlin that if we teach people how to do chaos engineering correctly and we help to uplift the community, that the right things will happen to us. And so there'll be a future webinar. What was the date again, Peter? on the 27th, where we're gonna have a more product focused one. We're gonna talk about how Gremlin emulates the dozen different failures at the infrastructure level. We're gonna talk about how we think about safety and security and how we built a product to really facilitate these needs. Um, 
But I will, I will pull out my soapbox and say, I think that safety and security are very important in chaos engineering. Um, our company tenants are safety, security, and simplicity. We know that this is potentially a risky experiment that we're running. It's a, it's a, can be, this, this approach is not without risk, is how I'll phrase it. And so wherever possible, we want to mitigate that risk. If we can add safety features into our products and into our tooling, so that we have less of a chance of shooting ourselves in the foot and, and more of an opportunity to safely complete our experiments, it's well worth that time and effort. Now, this could be something from a rollback or a halt button so that you can quickly halt the experiment and clean it up. It could be fail safes so that if your control plane or parts of your system are unresponsive or not working correctly, they're built to automatically revert back to steady state. Security is, is obviously critical here. Uh, and something that I think more and more chaos engineers a, as a whole need to be thoughtful of. Um, when we speak to customers and we tell them the types of experiments we want to run in production in the end, their security teams raise their hand and they want a little bit more information. Now I'm happy to say we've done a lot of work and effort to make this type of approach safe so that we're not running as root, so that we're using industry best standard, standards like single sign-on and multi-factor authentication. Uh, we at Gremlin, we pen test ourselves. We do intrusion detection. We're doing SOC 2. All of the things that, that show that we're thoughtful about security and we're investing in protecting our customers. Because if the outcome of a, a, of a chaos experiment is that you've created a security hole that puts your company at risk, you haven't mitigated risk, you've increased it. And then this, this is a bit of a, of an aside, but as an engineer, one of the things we learned building this tooling at Amazon and Netflix is that if you want people to do the right thing, you need to make it easy. And so we've focused a lot on building a good user interface, uh, an easy to understand API that can be built upon, uh, a good command line interface that gives you that control and flexibility when you need it. And so, you know, this is probably not a surprise to many of the people on this call. We've gotten used to better tools, better user interfaces, better guidance. But again, in a complicated space where people are still learning, wherever possible, if we can guide them and help them to make the right decisions and, and help them to avoid shooting themselves in the foot, those guardrails, those become important aspects to safely implementing this approach and getting the maximum value possible. And this isn't just something for Amazon and Netflix. Uh, there are lots of companies out there that are embracing this approach and having success. And we've been very, very privileged to be able to work with some great companies. We've been able to add value to them and help them on their journey. And that's really our focus and our goal here. If we can help engineers to not get paged, if we can help companies to have less downtime and to have more predictable systems, if we can all operate resilient systems better we're, we're winning as a we're winning as a team we're winning as a tribe we're winning as an industry and it's going to make our world better it's going to have that knock-on effect to our grandmas and our cousins our aunts and our uncles whomever's out there that feels the pain when our software doesn't work correctly or prevents them from doing what they want and that's really what our goal here is at gremlin we want to help build a more reliable internet so with that, I think we have some Q&A, but that is the, uh, the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for listening. All righty, thank you so much, Colton. So we do have a couple of questions. Uh, we have about 15 minutes to go through them, so uh, please submit them if you haven't already. Um, but first up, we have a couple of questions from AJ. Uh, AJ's asking, uh, how does Gremlin actually simulate CPU and memory usage uh, to 100%? Yes, so CPU and memory are, are kind of easy ones, right? Uh, do a bunch of floating point operations in a tight loop or try to consume and hold on to as much memory as possible. Um, I'll tell you from the experience of writing the memory gremlins a couple of times that uh, Linux is pretty good at, at preventing you from, from doing dumb things. And so you have to actually outsmart your operating system a fair amount to really hold on to uh, memory and to to trick it into thinking that it's unavailable and it really you just have to use it so that it's unavailable to be used by the operating system. And so the second question AJ had was, uh, can you do network latency with inward or ingress traffic, or is it only for outgress traffic? Yeah, so we have the ability to impact both directions of traffic. Um, 
but there, there are some limitations at the operating system level, but in general, yes. Uh, and there's value in both sides of that. Sometimes you want to be testing, uh, my service has gotten slow, how does the downstream handle it? Sometimes you want that impact of how that service, uh, how your service handles the downstream service failing. One, one interesting example that came up um, was for a video streaming team and they had a lot of UDP traffic, uh, you know, which is bi-directional over ports. And so that ability for them to slow down that UDP traffic to understand essentially how packet loss and delay affected the quality of the video stream uh, was a very interesting game day for me. So Vladislav has a question around how do we define the steady state of our system? What are the key metrics that we should use to describe it? Yeah, so I'd say that's one of the values of this approach is if you if you don't have a good feel of what steady state is for your system, that's a great place to begin. You know, often in our goals and, and in metrics improvement, we need a benchmark to understand what the world looks like today. And so what is a normal traffic pattern? What is normal API latency look like? What is your normal throughput and, and how long does it take for that work to happen? Um, you know, what is your resource utilization look like? It, it, in steady state, you know, your CPU, your memory, your disk, your IO overhead. Um, th those are the places where I would begin. But I think there's a, the reason that's a great question is those are kind of the, the second level, those are the technical metrics, you know, is our service operating well? What often matters most are the business metrics. So at Amazon, it's orders per minute and Netflix, it's stream starts per second. But those are the metrics that really are one-to-one -one with customer pain or customer activity. And so those become very key metrics that you always wanna watch while running these experiments so that you're able to understand if you've caused customer pain. So next question, Sebastian's asking, uh, I already practice chaos engineering. Uh, so far at my company, there were three sessions. Uh, what's the best approach for documenting results of these exercises? Currently we write down uh, the root cause, for example, network delays, impacted services, and uh, basically action items, created tasks. Uh, is there something that we should be adding? Is there something more to this? You know, that's a great question. And, you know, what's what's fun in this space is we're still learning a lot of what best practice looks like. And so I think you've got a good starting list there about what types of things are, are interesting to capture. Certainly, all potentially all root causes, all contributing factors that you found, all things that kind of behaved unexpected. Um, one thing that I've learned is it's some things can feel small, but end up being quite large in retrospect when they've caused an outage. And so sometimes it's the configuration value that was out of place or something that was too permissive or globally scoped and catching those and identifying them can be very, very big wins. This is one of the, the the hardships we have in chaos engineering is if we've done our job well and we've prevented outages, it's hard to say how big of an outage we prevented. And so the ability to understand everything that could have contributed to that outage helps us to justify the time and effort spent in, in hardening our system and preventing it. So Pratik is asking what skills are required for running uh, game days or chaos experiments? Yeah, I think, I think that it's really, it's about that operational maturity. So if you are comfortable operating your service and you understand kind of its ins and outs and how to measure it, then, then you should be comfortable running a chaos experiment on it. Honestly, the, the flip is, the, the converse is true as well. If you're not yet comfortable operating your service and you're not quite sure how things are, work when things go wrong, then this is a good tool to allow you to understand and explore that space. And so again, be mindful of the blast radius and run small experiments. But if you're unsure where your limits are, or if you're unsure if your paging or monitoring works correctly, if it scares you to death, what might happen if something goes wrong in your system, it's in your best interest to as safely as possible go out and build that familiarity and start to build that comfort with your system. The <laughs> We do have some resources available. So we have taken our, our best bet to try to capture what a good game day looks like and how to capture the results. And our success team has made this available on our website for anyone to download. It's at uh, gremlin.com slash game day. Um, and we'd love feedback on, on how to improve it if, uh, if, you have, if you have other ideas. Great, so the next question is from Gayet. 
uh, so far, most things I've seen are focused on infrastructure as a service. Uh, what about platform as a service and serverless? Uh, you know, that's what a cloud is all, all about currently. Yeah. So I, I definitely think if we continued on on that maturity model, the next step is bringing this approach up to the application level. And I purposely did not go into that here as this was meant to be a more introduction level uh, discussion. But what we built at Netflix, the successor to, to Chaos Monkey and some of the Simeon Army was an application level fault injection approach. And what that allows us to do is within our code, you know, imagine you can place a cut point or you can wrap a function and then you can cause delay or failure. This allows us to go run the types of experiments you're describing. Let's put this in a serverless environment. Let's put this, um, let's put this into our platform libraries. Let's put this into our application code. You know, what happens if uh, a class of users experiences a failure? What happens if um, there's just a, a subset problem? Also, that allows us to be much more precise in the approach. Uh, often at the application level, we have concepts that are request level things like customer ID or device ID or region or, or other, other attributes that we can use to narrow down the blast radius and run these experiments. So Gremlin actually released a, an Alfie uh, application layer fault injection product uh, to beta last fall that is meant to be used in serverless and that mirrors this approach that we took at Netflix. So I imagine we'll have its, uh, our own session on that topic, but if that's something you'd like to dive deeper into, feel free to reach out to me and and we can spend some more time. Great, so uh, Jigar has a question around security. Um, does this software work in-house on-prem, uh, inside our network or uh, externally? Yeah, so Gremlin is failure as a service. So we've built it as a SaaS product. Uh, there are agents that you install in your infrastructure, but as of today, we're not offering an on-premise solution. Again, we're very thoughtful about how to use this security and how to uh, make it safe. And so we have many publicly traded uh, financial and other customers that are using Gremlin today that are comfortable with the mitigations we've taken. Um, but the short answer is uh, we think the we think the way software is moving is toward SaaSs and services and online platforms and less toward your classic, you know, we're gonna ship you, we're gonna ship you our software, you're gonna have to own and operate it, hope everything goes well approach of on-prem. Right, next up we have Sai Lin. Is there any plan to run uh, about five day chaos engineering boot camps uh, for those who are planning to enter into the chaos engineering career track? It's a great idea. Um, Tammy and Anna on my team have been running chaos engineering boot camps for the past year. Uh, they had the opportunity to do some at, uh, at QCon and at Velocity and at SRECon. We would, uh, we would love to continue to, to help the community and learning in this spaces. Um, we're happy to sponsor a variety of meetups around the country that really, you know, we want we want local experts coming and speaking and sharing what they've learned. Um, we also launched our inaugural conference last year, Chaos Conf, uh, which was well attended and we received good feedback on. And so we're happy to to tease that that Chaos Conf will be coming back this year, and that'll be another great in depth learning session. So Fred is asking, have you successfully run impactful ingest and query tests against Elasticsearch uh, to determine when and where things start falling down? So Elasticsearch, uh, Kafka, some log processing tools, uh, those are all, uh, and then Kubernetes just as a whole, are the types of technologies that a lot of our customers are using. And so yes, we've run a variety of game days on those technologies. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say let's take that offline if you want to go deeper. I'm, I'm not prepared to give you a, a debrief of some of those game days. But the short answer is uh, if there's new tech that your company is using, if you're in the process of doing a migration to the cloud, to Kubernetes or some new platform, in my opinion, you should be doing yourself a favor and mitigating the risk of that investment by doing chaos engineering and hardening your system before you shift customer traffic onto it. Uh, the short an the, the question was, you know, with the complexity of these systems, how do we really do this safely? Because there could still be these knock on effects. And the answer is that's correct. There could be knock on effects. And we want to find them during the day when the caffeine's kicked in, when everyone's paying attention. But we can still mitigate the risk. We shouldn't be running in prod until we've built a lot of confidence in staging. And we've tested to the scale available to us there. 
Then when we go into prod, we're not running at 100% of production traffic out the gate. We might start with 0.01% production traffic. And if there's a knock-on effect, hopefully that knock-on effect is on the magnitude that we're seeing there. And then as we continue going on, we can increase that, that blast radius. So at 1% or 10%, we might uncover that knock-on effect, but we'd rather find it as soon as we hit that tipping point. And at that point, we stop the experiment, we understand what the source of that knock-on effect is, and we can help mitigate it. So Sean is asking, outside of availability, systems being online or offline, CPU memory resource utilization and latency, what other pop popular Gremlin experiments exist for assessing the health of an application? Yeah, so Sean's, Sean's named a few. So things, we can be resource constrained. What happens when we're, we're bound on CPU, memory, disk, IO? There can be things that can go wrong with time, with processes dying, with host rebooting. And then there can be things that can go wrong at the network level. There can be straight black hole, things that never arrive. There can be packet loss. There can be delay. There can be DNS failures, the inability to look up DNS things. To date, that's, that's, the, that's what we found to be the most effective common denominator across most people's infrastructures and outages. And then we, by moving up into the application level, that allows us to go into a much uh, a much more fine-grained, precise way to simulate many more failures. So Sim is asking, do you have any ways of creating memory leaks? Yeah, so, so the memory gremlin is built to simulate memory leaks and to cause, uh, to cause memory to be unavailable, to see what happens when you start to get into swap and to start uh, contending for memory with other processes. Another question from Sean, how about chaos testing against APIs? Yeah, I think there's a lot of value in testing against APIs. So in particular, the team that I was on at Netflix, uh, ironically enough, wasn't the chaos engineering team. It was the edge platform team. And we owned the proxy and the API gateway. And the reason we cared so much about this approach is if any of our mid-tier services failed and caused us to fail, then Netflix was down because we were the API. And so, it's absolutely worth going through and, and ensuring that your API and your service is resilient. Now, in this case, most of our outages were coming from mid-tier services that were cascading failure or weren't handling things well. And so when we were able to work with those teams to improve that, we got into a much more stable spot. Um, so, yeah. All right. Well, I think that's all the questions we have today. Uh, apologize for the ad hoc live chaos experiment, but that's part of life. Uh, we appreciate everyone's time and the opportunity for you to come and to join us. We hope you found this to be useful. Again, me and my team are here and available. We love talking about this. We love teaching people about this. If you wanna learn more, we'd encourage you to come join our, our public chaos engineering Slack. Uh, it's, it's not focused on Gremlin, it's focused on just teaching everyone what we've learned and best practices. With that, I'll turn it over to Peter if there's any logistics to close things out. All righty, well, thanks again, everyone, for, for coming today. Uh, again, this, uh, this session is recorded, and you can expect to see that in your inbox uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, but with that, thank you very much, Colton. Uh, I hope you all learned something today, uh, and thank you for coming.